Tonight's guest is a man I have wanted to interview for so long, but up until a short while ago, he had been in prison, but that's another story. Um, but tonight we of course are delighted to be joined by Fritz Springmeier, someone who I consider to be an absolute doyen of Illuminati, mind control and entertainment industry cult research. And of course, uh, Fritz has authored several books. Um, I'll just go through the titles, so for those of you who, who may recognize some of these. Um, of course, Bloodlines of the Illuminati. And then of course, there's Deeper Insights into the Illuminati Mind Control. And his most famous being the book he co-authored with Cisco Wheeler being The Illuminati Formula to Create a Totally Undetectable Mind Control Slave. Um, Fritz's earlier work, uh, The Watchtower and the Masons, um, actually focuses on the relationship between the Jehovah's Witnesses and Freemasonry. And in this book, he describes a relationship between Charles uh, Tate Russell, I beg your pardon, Charles Taze Russell, and the so-called Eastern Establishment of New York's banking elite. Fritz followed these links into Freemasonry and did further examination into the banking establishment. And um, of course, a lot of this has gotten into quite a bit of trouble. Hello, Fritz. Hello, Melanie. Hey, can you hear me over there? Yes, great. Fantastic. You're coming in clear. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Fitz, for joining us. I know it's uh, Sunday morning there in Oregon, and uh, we are absolutely delighted to have you with us live here on Finding Voices Radio. It's a true honor. As I've already mentioned in my intro, uh, we at Freedom Central consider you to be an absolute doyen of this sort of research and the research upon which many other greats thereafter you came and uh, sort of stole bits and pieces from and uh, incorporated into their own research. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, and hi to all your listeners out there. Um, thanks, Fritz. Okay, um, you, you're a very interesting and very colorful person, so I'm going to ask you, please, just to tell us a little bit about your journey before we dive into all this information. Well, similar to you, I have gotten a chance to have uh, a perspective on different cultures because... I did a lot of traveling as a child. I grew up in Nepal between India and Tibet. I know that you had grown up in, in South Africa. And when you have a chance to see different cultures, different countries, it broadens your perspective. So I, I think there were a lot of things in my childhood that contributed to uh, eventually where I ended up. It wasn't just something that just happened one day. Um, uh, because I, I got to see uh, uh, American life and American culture as an outsider, even though nationally I'm an American. But, um, you know, a lot of people, it seems like as a child you grow up and you just accept everything as it is and you don't, you don't question why. And maybe a lot of people are going through their lives in the rat race, never asking themselves any questions about, about life in general, what they're doing or, or, or what's what's happening around them. They just seem to, you know, go through this rat race without analyzing things. But I had a, a chance to get an outside perspective. So very early on, um, even when I was a young man at West Point, I started having some serious questions about the system and um, and, and tried to get out of the system, in fact, when I was 19, because I was, I was so horrified by so many things that the system is involved with and doing. And, and so this has kind of been a, a lifetime journey for me. It, it's not like all of a sudden I woke up and one day and decided to take on the powers that be. Um, it's been a lifetime journey. Uh, that's... That uh, kind of lays kind of a foundation there. I, you know, it, it's just like so many things, and I'm kind of rambling here, but, but you know, we, we had the Olympics re recently, and, and, of course, like you were mentioning, if I had gone to church, then, then you sing uh, special songs in church that, uh, that the people that performed in the Olympics and got medals, there were stories behind that. 
um, you go to church and you sing these wonderful hymns, there's stories behind those hymns. Likewise, you know, there's a story behind the books that I've written, the story behind the story, but it's so vast <laughs> that it, it really doesn't lend itself to, to talking about here, but one of the things that helped my research a lot is, is I was involved with people that had actually been members of the Illuminati. I, I worked with a lot of people that uh, uh, were or were trying to escape the Illuminati, and um, that gave me as a researcher an inside perspective, which uh, deepened my work um, and I, I gave, gave my, my work the depth that other people in the past hadn't been able to do. Wow, that's quite something, Fritz. So, it was just kind of synchronicity that you came across these people or, um, you know, coincidence? How, you know, how did these insiders or Illuminati members come to you? <laughs> D divine synchronicity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I had been... I had been uh, researching the Illuminati very extensively and had written a lot. Um, and at that point, a friend of mine, um, a, a Christian brother, uh, happened to uh, happened to meet four women that were were teamed together that were trying to get out of the Illuminati, and he told them. Uh, if they were in, interested in the Illuminati, that they should meet me because I was the uh, master researcher on it, and so that's that's when I I went from just looking at the whole thing from the outside to getting an inside picture. And although they were not able to tell me a lot of the details um, because they had mind control programming that if they talked about a lot of the details and they went into suicide programming um they they were able to give me bits and pieces to point me in the right direction they they talked about the mind control which which they were having to work against to try to get their freedom they talked about the bloodlines and i had already uh recognized that bloodlines were important so in the first meeting that I had with them I printed out a computer printout of powerful bloodlines and and I asked them if they would uh, circle amongst all these names the top 13 because I knew that the the Illuminati had chosen 13 bloodlines uh, to be prominent um, they have a special standing, so to speak. They're like tribes. So I asked them to circle that, and they circled the, uh, except I had left off a couple because I wasn't, there was, uh, in fact, the, the one that I wasn't aware of was the Van Dyne family, which is an um, old uh, Dutch family that's an old noble Dutch family, and um, I wasn't aware of the, the Van Dynes being one of the top families. And um, it's, it's after they, they uh, told me that the Van Dyne family was one of the top 13, and I've gotten a lot of grief by a lot of people that are uninformed for using that name as one of the top 13. But, but since then, I've, I've had uh, verification from other um, ex Illuminati sources that indeed they they are a top thirteen bloodline. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm uh, I should let you get to your questions. I, I tend to to uh, give lengthy answers. <laughs> no, no, I love it. I, the digressions often render some of the best information. Thank you, Fritz. Talking about, let's talk about the bloodlines. Uh, let's name them. Who are they, and what sort of control they have over humanity? Uh, in alphabetical order, you have Astor, and then Bundy, and Collins, and then DuPont, and then Freeman, and, and then you have the Lee, and the Kennedy, and the Onassis, and you have the Rockefellers, and 
the Rothschilds and the Russell family, and then there's a 13th bloodline, a holy bloodline, which uh, incorporates your royal families of the aristocracy, the royal families of Europe, which are all just uh, interbred. And um, <laughs> it, it's most amazing when you look at the history of Europe. It, you know, you think that uh, the ruler of one country would be somehow connected to the native population, and then you realize, oh, no, they're, <laughs> they're related to some other country, actually, to the royalty of some other country. And, um, and, and even though wars go on between these various countries that at the top they're all related most amazing uh, <laughs> and then uh, and then the uh, there the the Krupp family was was listed as one of the top families and I've wondered if maybe they haven't gotten elbowed out in recent years um, they definitely were a powerful family back um, in, in, in the 40s and maybe the 50s but and then another prominent family, which may or may not be still be a top 13 family, was the Reynolds family. Um, a lot of these names are household names, like DuPont. You, you go into stores, and there there isn't a single day that an American doesn't use some product that uh, the DuPont companies uh, make. Uh, likewise, you know, Reynolds is a household name, um, and, and then, uh, hmm, did I get them all? Uh, yeah, I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you mentioned something interesting there, the holy uh, bloodline being uh, the royalty all come from this, so you're obviously talking about all these sort of the royalty of Europe. Um, the ones that are quite prominent and probably some some that we don't know of like the less prominent ones that are hiding in Brussels etc um, why are they referred to as the holy bloodline well um, there, there was a, a trilogy of books by a trilogy of authors holy blood holy grail uh, messianic legacy the um, the king uh, the uh, Messianic uh, and the Temple and the Lodge, those those three. And they do a, a good job of showing how uh, um, there's been this thread of, of belief that they have the blood of Christ in them. Um, and uh, the, the, it's connected with the King Arthur legend and the Holy Grail, and there's definitely something there. Um, it, it's I, I've been watching these bloodlines, and it's been important for them to promote the concept of Camelot, King Arthur. Uh, I, you know, you would you would think, well, King Arthur. That's just one more story out of out of thousands around the world but it's definitely being promoted you know for instance I, I went to uh, Portland State University one time to do research and the whole downstairs of the university library was taken up with displays about the King Arthur legend you know um, obviously somebody considers it important that university students uh, think about King the King Arthur legend, you know, amongst the, the many things that compete for, for people's attention. Um, and why is this? It, it, it's, uh, it's, it goes back to this concept that, that they have special blood and um, special power, um, and, and uh, that makes them special over the rest of us. <laughs> in their eyes <laughs> yeah and of course these people who believe they've got special uh, powers uh, engage in some pretty gruesome um, activities have you actually um, spoken to people and, and gotten details of this yes um, wow over the years I have spoken with quite a number of eyewitnesses 
for instance, um, I spoke with a detective who spied on an Illuminati ritual. Um, he had to hide out and using um, binoculars, and, and he had several people with him to protect him. He was able to sneak up into the mountains and watch an Illuminati ritual. Um, he was surprised because the security that was being done for the Illuminati ritual was being carried out by the county sheriff department, <laughs> which in that particular county is dirty. The, the, the head sheriff is part of the Illuminati coven there, so it's a surprise. Um, I spoke with one woman who had been, she had been kidnapped and um, she was, she had been slated to be uh, a human sacrifice on one of their standard ritual days. She had managed to escape and um, when she got home, now this is really bizarre, but it shows, it sh shows the extent of the powers that be. The she escaped. She's there. There's no reason for the police to show up or anything, right? But they showed up, and um, they grabbed her, and a judge committed her to uh, uh, to, to be institutionalized, um, and um, they were going to drug her and everything. And she managed to escape that too, and um, being aware of what I'm involved with came to visit me. Of course, when people like this show up on my doorstep, I'm, I'm not really in much of a position to help them. But, uh, um, you know, you can tell when people have been through a trauma and they're ter terrorized and they're traumatized just the way they talk, you know. You can't fake, you can't fake a trauma like that. Um, so, you know, um, I got that eyewitness. I got an eyewitness report of somebody who had almost lost their life. They had stumbled upon a high-level ritual and had to run for their life. They just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and, and the ritual security would have, would have grabbed them if they had had a chance. They just barely got away. So, yeah, I have... Uh, I talked with a, a policeman who talked about how somebody had taken photos um, from a distance of a ritual and had turned them, it was a human sacrifice going on, and he turned his photographs into the local police, and then the state police came and uh, covered it all up and took the photographs. So, <laughs> so yeah, I've, I've uh, over the years, had... had uh, that's just a, a, a sampling of, of many, uh, many um, eyewitnesses because uh, it's like, like they say, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Well, if you're information rich like I am, then you're just knowed with more witnesses and more people coming. I have people all the time coming with their life story. Somehow they think that uh, I'm the person that will get their their life story out or, or their story of trauma or something out. Of course, I, I'm, I'm not in a position to do that for everyone, but uh, I, I do try to listen. Yeah. Yes, of course, we understand that we, we, we've um, found ourselves in that position too, and um, it uh, can be quite taxing at times, I know. Um, now, I just want to talk a little bit about these rituals. Um, what is the actual point behind this? They, they, they kidnap people. I know they also farm people. They've got little communities in, in Belgium, uh, right outside Chateau Amara, the um, dark, Mother of Darkness Castle, where they breed um, babies for sacrifice in closed communities. Apart from that, that I understand they're possibly also kidnapping um, children for these rituals. Now, what is the actual point behind this? Wow, um, and that, there, there's a lot of reasons. It, uh, one thing is, is it goes back to antiquity, thinking the the concept that. Uh, you gain power and you appease the gods by doing these sacrifices, and they want the they want the purest sacrifice. 
a child being innocent, um, uh, that innocent blood is a good sacrifice. It seems like all these, you know, a lot of, not all, but you, you see in, in the ancient Middle East, they've been covered uh, the, the sites where thousands of, of remains of babies, sacrificed babies, uh, um, are still there. Uh, it, it seems it seems like it's been a, a popular perversion of of people practicing magic to think that the supreme sacrifice is to take this innocent child and um, that that's somehow going to to give them power and and um, uh, appease whoever needs to be appeased as far as the, the demonic entities. Um, it also serves the purpose of mind control, and it serves the purpose of controlling the members. Uh, when you're uh, a little child in the Illuminati, one of the first uh, rituals that they, they have you carry out is where you do a ritual sacrifice of another child. And... Um, you can imagine the spiritual and the mental ramifications of this, um, and it's to lock the person into their control. Um, it's to dirty whatever you might self-respect you might have, and uh, make you more easier to control. Um, so it's also used for purposes of mind control. Um, uh, you you know how. Uh, criminals can have a shared uh, brotherhood. Well, if you've all participated in sacrificing someone, you can imagine that in, in a perverted way that bonds you together. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I'm So there, there's a number of reasons. Yeah, okay. Um, so we've got all these uh, people perform these sacrifices uh, for various reasons. Magic being one of them, um, mind control being the other. Now, let's go on to the mind control aspect because this is something that fascinates me endlessly is that you've actually written a book um, which details how to create a totally undetectable mind control slave. And I'd like you to please take us through that in some detail because um, mind control is something that's very fascinating to me. Every known technique that's ever been created, and I'm sure quite a few that we're not familiar with too, have been incorporated, have been engineered into a group package. Um, and actually this kind of mind control has been going on for thousands of years. I, I had the privilege of exposing it. Um, and and it, it totally locks a person in. Uh, I was reading an interview that the DCI of the CIA was giving in front of Congress, and he was pretending like the CIA had not been successful with their MK Ultra program, because you know we tried this, but it only worked sixty percent of the time. We tried this, it only worked seventy percent of the time, implying that uh, a technique that only works seventy percent of the time is of no use. Well. It would be if it was used only by itself, but when you engineer a sophisticated package of all of these these hundreds of techniques, you end up locking the person totally into the control. And some of these in themselves would be sufficient to do the job, let alone being uh, coupled with, with all these other methods. So... And what we have is, is we have trauma. Trauma is used to split the mind, so it, it's divide and conquer. The mind is split from itself into, into many different dissociative pieces. And those pieces are picked up by the programmer, and he can lock them in, and he can program each of those pieces. They will make uh, multiple personality disorder out of those dissociative pieces. And um, now that's known as... DID. Um, for some reason, the system decided multiple personality disorder was 
was too good of a name to call multiple personalities. So it's called Dissociative Identity Disorder. Um, then they also use drugs. They use electroshock. Electroshock and electronics uh, carry out several purposes. One is electroshock, if, if used at the right time, takes your memory out. You can also use drugs. They use uh, a, a programming center will have in the neighborhood of about six, 800 drugs. And these drugs can do all kinds of things. Like, you know, the, the drug that's been in the news recently, scopoline, which will, which will make a person totally compliant. A uh, person receiving that, which is colorless, becomes totally compliant and will even give you their bank account number so that you can, that, you know, take all their money out of their bank account or whatever else you're wanting them to do. Um, so they, they have this wide uh, pharmacy of different drugs that they can use for different programming uh, needs. Um, and, and then they use deception, and then uh, they use exterior and interior controls. They build interior controls into the person, and they, they also have exterior controls. When I mean exterior controls, there's there's such a wide uh, range of these, uh, you know, I'm just touching a little bit, but, but you will be surrounded with people like a mother will spy on the husband, the husband will spy on the mother, um, the mother will spy on the kids, kids will spy on the mother, everybody's watching everybody, making sure everybody's staying in place. Um, uh, and then uh, surrounding that, you've got even more uh, controls. The, the, the buildings, the architecture of the buildings, you know, um, the, the things that are being put on the radio, things that are being put on the television. Um, basically, what we have going on is one big mind-controlled lab. Um, if people read the, and, and besides the formula book that you were talking about, I had two other books. The sequel to the formula books, the Deeper Insights book, and um, if your readers happen to get those, and they can get those uh, on my blog, which is pentracks.com, if they happen to get those and read those, they're going to be amazed because they're going to start seeing this mind control, this total mind control being done all around them. They're, they're going to realize we're just in one big mind controlled lab where, oh, <laughs> like a big Petri dish. <laughs> It, it's it's yeah it, it's it's uh, startling yeah. and then you look at you look at the like the Olympic uh, opening ceremonies which was just full of uh, occult and mind control uh, symbology triggers and so forth uh, they say that one billion people watched the opening ceremony of the Olympics you know what a, a wonderful vehicle. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity to carry out um, a broad-based um, control of, of people out there. And I've, I've, I've been warning people that events like that are used um, for, for uh, they play an important role in the mind control. Um, they they have clocks with mental clocks within these systems of altars that they create and and those clocks don't go around by calendar days they go around by events so when princess Di has her marriage when princess Di dies you know all these events are are have been programmed in to turn the clock so that the the program person, the slave, will carry out their part in the script according to to the turning of this clock, which is which is turning by these world events. So um, anyway, uh, that's probably some answer. <laughs> that's very you. it's very interesting for us because you know we've had so much come out about the Olympics and I'm so pleased you've brought that up. Uh, prior to the Olympics there's been 
endless amounts of people um, coming up with videos um, and things that they found in various places which point to that the fact that there could be some kind of false flag associated with these Olympics or there is some kind of programming involved and it's, it's just everywhere the, the the evidence is everywhere we found it on BBC clips it's um what what do you think do you think there's going to be something involved uh, with this well, uh, as you know, the the today is the last day uh, of the competition, and um, I prior to the Olympics, people were asking me if they thought that there was going to be a terrorist attack, a false flag, something like nine eleven, and here's what I was telling people. You know, of course, I don't have a crystal ball, and I'm not God, so. I can't predict the future, but based on what I've seen in the last 20-some years of watching, uh, this is like 25 years of watching the system, um, the, it, it, this, this came across to me very similar to the Y2K thing, where they use fear and rumors of disaster, and they get more they get more mileage out of out of just frightening people than something actually happening. Um, back about 1996, I noticed that people that were in the system were getting the Y2K thing started. And so when I start seeing some certain uh, markers, I start identifying things as a rumor to frighten us rather than something that was actually going to happen and that's the way I had this peg so far um, it looks it looks um, like the way I had it pegged is going to pan out uh, it was definitely a great uh, ceremony for the Illuminati they put their their symbology their subliminals and and, and everything uh, you know it was an occult ritual um, that a billion people watched, and um, uh, yeah, it was a great extravaganza for them. Uh, uh, you probably saw at least a little bit of it. Yeah, they did. And all the pyramids and eyes and, and, and all the rest. <laughs> yeah, we did. I, I was wondering, Fritz, if you could comment at all about, um, you know, there's so many different sports and things being played there. Um, I've got a working hypothesis that, you know, even sporting events are somewhat ritualistic in themselves. And then you've got all these sporting events together. So it's mini rituals in a sort of an overall big ritual, which is the Olympic Games. Am I correct? Yeah. It, uh, you know, everything for them has their significance. And um, I, I'm starting to think along the lines of you that there's there's more there's even uh, subplots within subplots or subscripts, you know, sub-rituals within rituals. Um, it seems like there's some of that, and I'm, I, I'm wondering, too, if there isn't some manipulation of the sports, too. Um, I, but I can't really put my finger on it. One of the things that I was going to write a book exposing which would make me extremely unpopular in America, was how their professional sports are rigged. Um, and um, I haven't accomplished that yet, so, so I haven't become as unpopular as I could make myself. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I'm wondering, you know, if, if any time that there's money and power involved, there there's always somebody uh, trying to pull strings behind it. And, and where we have, um, you know, China, the prestige of China, the prestige of America, and, and, and there is money involved in all of this, um, I, I, I'm having to wonder um, at what level the manipulation is being carried out. Um, but like you say, there, there's... There's probably some um, ritual significances to some of the, the individual events, too.
Yeah. Now, I would like your opinion on perhaps uh, what are your thoughts on mind controlled sports people? Can people be so traumatized that they become talented? Well, in fact, for some sports, they prefer uh, people that have been uh, um, put under this total mind control. One of the attributes uh, of this is, is the, the person who's a program multiple, is very dissociative towards pain. Um, and in some of these sports, you have to be able to dissociate the pain. In some of these sports, uh, you need to be able to, um, you, you get tired. And a, a multiple personality, uh, it, it, it's amazing. I've watched this because I work with a, a lot of multiples. And let's say you have a personality that's that's tired. Well, they can switch the body with another personality that's dissociating from the body, and that new personality it still feels mentally fresh and doesn't feel the tiredness. Um, so for some competitive events, it would probably be advantageous to have somebody who could overcome the pain and, and the tiredness because they're dissociative. Um, you might also be able to get some people to uh, focus better because uh, one of the things that the mind control does is allow certain parts of the mind to become very intense and focused. So. Yeah, I was watching some of the events to see if I could uh, if I could detect that the individuals were definitely um, multiple personalities. I, I I think I saw a few that looked to me like they were multiples. Uh, it's just something I'm not at the level um, where I can definitively say it. Where. Uh, Cisco, who, who I brought out of the Illuminati, her programming alters were phenomenal. They, they could look at a person and they could tell me the entire story of what was going on. Um, but I'm not that at that level. But I, I, I did see some, some clues that led me to believe that some of the people anyway, some of the, the athletes were multiple. Do you know of any big uh, names? Sports personalities, perhaps Tiger Woods, maybe one of the Williams sisters in tennis, anybody who perhaps you could um, say would possibly fit the profile of someone who is mind-controlled sports personality? Boy, off the top of my head, I, I, I couldn't give you any name. I really couldn't. Okay. Um, and Part of that probably is, is a function of the fact that I don't watch a lot of television um, for several reasons. One is since I'm busy with real life, and two, <laughs> because television programming is just what they tell, they tell us it is. It's programming. <laughs> yeah, well, fair enough. Okay, well, um, I obviously would love to then ask, moving away from sport and into the side of entertainment, um, you know, I'm sure you must have an idea of people within the entertainment, be it music or film industry, who are mind controlled. Oh, the, the film industry? Yeah, under and, mind and music. And, and let's talk about people who you've definitively identified as potentially mind controlled within film and music. Oh, boy. When it comes to the film industry, it's almost like who's the exception? When it comes to the. Uh, icons, the, the music industry, again, uh, most of your icons, maybe all of them, uh, are, are under the, the mind control. Uh, Madonna, she's a good example of somebody who's um, a Satanist, uh, a program to multiple, and they've turned her into an icon. Um, the first uh, presidential model that they allowed to go public, Marilyn Monroe, uh, she was a programmed multiple. She had no life of her own. Um, you know, she was a, a, a dysfunctional person off of the screen. And when she went to act, they would have to do t takes and retakes because they had, they had 
messed up her mind so badly with the mind control she was barely functional. But they did manage to make her into a sexual icon that they still continue to roll out. Um, but Marilyn Monroe is a good example of a sexual slave that uh, um, a beta model that uh, they produced. They, they on the average have around six, seven hundred presidential models that wherever the U.S. president can go, he can always be sexually serviced by uh, a presidential model. Um, and that carries out several functions. One is, is it ensures that the president uh, is not going to do anything that's a breach of national security. Um, women have a, 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 a power over men that um, if, if, a, if a man is involved in sexual activity with a woman, uh, she can extract a lot of information from them. So it's so part of it, in that particular case, there is actually an element of national security involved in having uh, presidential models, these sexual slaves, um, that have been programmed with the Illuminati's total mind control. But um, it still doesn't subtract from the horror of the whole thing. Um, yeah, most of your your big name film uh, actors, um, and definitely across the board. Um, uh, in fact, I give lists uh, of. Uh, I think I do. Um, if I haven't, I I, sh I should have or, or somewhere I've I've got lists. I think it's in the uh, in the mind control books of rock stars and uh, country western singers, uh, a lot of your people coming out of Nashville, um, our program multiples. Um, and, uh, yeah, I could go on. I don't know that it's... Uh, if anybody should be singled out any more than anybody else, um, somebody that's really funny, Jim Carrey, uh, he did Me, Myself, and I, which is a film about multiplicity, and he himself is a program multiple. Um, Roseanne Barr, who was a comedian, and she came out of obscurity. Roseanne Barr has gone public about being a program multiple, and I was watching her one time talk, and she made a statement, which, which is true, uh, if you know the, what they do in, in the programming process, what she said was true, but if you stop to think about it for a minute, it was, is really um, an incredible statement. She said that she had been uh, screwed every imaginable way that is possible. Well, <laughs> if you take that, if you, if you think what she was saying there, you really you really get uh, an insight into the programming traumas that they, they carry out on, on the people. Um, and I don't mean to make light of it, because uh, I just hearing about the traumas traumatizes me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, uh, you know, I, I can smile, but these things are... are extremely horrible and um and and that's why i've been motivated to step forward and try to do something something that's always fascinated me fritz is how for example we look at the television screen or the movie screen we see for example britney spears classic case of someone has been programmed um dancing around and and young girls aspire to little do they know that she's probably been as you know roseanne barr says screwed every way she can you know they've hurt her they've probably tortured her um into what she is and yet you've got millions of girls all around the world aspiring to be what she is and if they really knew what she was and what she had to go through to be there would they want to be that it very well said if they had even if they even got a glimpse of of what this person had been through they would they would not want to uh 
they would not want to emulate her life at all. Now, Wayne Newton was quite a singer. Um, uh, he One of the venues where Wayne Newton would sing was, was Las Vegas. Maybe some of the listeners know him. Yes. And Wayne Newton had no control over any of his finances. He never wrote a check. He never determined where the money was spent for him. He was totally under the control of his handlers. He was another program multiple. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, so in, in exchange for thing, they give their life and their freedom away and are captives of the powers that be. Um, no, it's a horrific life. And um, I wouldn't want it on anybody. Um, yeah, exactly. Just like you said, the, these these women, or I, I shouldn't say women, these girls that are just oogling and awing, oh, I wish I was that. No, they would not want to be that at all. They don't know what they're wanting. In fact, sometimes I see uh, girls take off, they leave their, their families, and they head off to Hollywood thinking that, you know, they're going to uh, become something like that, and they don't even know what they're getting into. It's sad. It's really sad. Yeah. Um, something I um, wanted, wanted to ask you about is, um, of course, there's a number of people with, within the sort of Hollywood entertainment industry who are mind-controlled, but is there an actual choice? Like, say, for example, you, you come into Hollywood, you come into the music industry, and you obviously you, you come into contact with someone who says, okay, you can be famous, but you kind of have to sell your soul to Satan or, you know, sign yourself over to the Illuminati for their control. Um, have you heard of this particular choice, or is, is this something you're familiar with? Yes, we were... Yeah, we're we're talking about now two different things. One is is somebody who Benet Ram like Benet Ramsey has been programmed from little childhood up to be something like this, um, like Shirley Temple. She was programmed from early childhood up to be something that they wanted to make. But you also have people that, as adults, they. Um, that want to join themselves to this. If you want to uh, participate in all of this, there will definitely be uh, repeated places where you have to sell your soul. Um, the, the, the very famous one, which uh, doesn't take exposing because it's well known, is the casting couch. Um, to get into the movie industry, of course, the, the person who does the casting wants you to to give up your sexual favors. Um, so it's a constant um, selling your soul. Um, and, and yeah, there will be actually some point, some of the, the actors have actually come out and said, you know, that uh, I, 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 I sold my soul to Satan in order to get this. They, they've actually publicly said it. So, um, so, so, so I'm not saying anything that hasn't been uh, yeah. revealed by yeah. some of the people themselves. <laughs> now, let me ask you: Does selling the soul often include sacrifices? I mean, um, it just seems there's an awful lot of celebrities who've lost children in strange circumstances or family members, tragically, particularly very famous ones. Yeah, that, that's definitely going on. Um, you reckon that they actually, there are people who are told, okay, if you want to be famous, you have to commit a murder, but, you know, does that happen? Does that happen? Yeah, the, 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 it, it's like the, the system, if the system is going to give, they're going to take. Uh, and they want to make sure that anybody who gets into a position of, um, where they could be a spokesperson, where, where people will pay attention to them. They want to make sure that those people are controlled. You, you know, when you go through the checkout stand in the store and you see all of these pictures on the front of magazines, just know that those people um, are, are under blackmail, are under other circumstances that have taken oaths, vows, uh, other things so that the system feels confident 
that they uh, have some control over what that person is going to to say and do. Um, it doesn't mean that everybody toes the line. Um, the expression follow the yellow brick road means to follow the programming. Not everybody exactly follows the yellow brick road, but in general, they, they do well enough that the system... Um, it, it, the system chugs along without much uh, interruption. So does this mean that there are literally no people in... I mean, you can't really be a famous person in this sort of pseudo-fake entertainment media world at all, can you? No, it's the world system, you know. Yeah. So fame isn't even a real thing. It's 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 actually a complete horrific nightmare once you're in it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when when I got Cisco out of the uh, got got her basically deprogrammed, one of her programmers had the audacity to come right into the house and uh, right in front of me. Um, he offered her. A career in Las Vegas if she would if she would give up what she was doing. <laughs> wow! <laughs> right in front of me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, she didn't want that. She she knew where their money came from. It was blood money from evil, and she knew what they were about. And she didn't uh, she didn't strike a bargain with with Satan. <laughs> but they certainly gave it right there in the open. All right, just before the break, we were talking about entertainment and music industry, um, mind-controlled slaves, and, of course, the cost of fame. Um, something I wanted to get into now is, obviously, within the last few years, we have seen um, the sad slaying and sacrifice of some of the greatest artists of our time. And um, I wanted to ask your opinion on, with regards to people like Michael Jackson, Amy Winehouse, uh, Whitney Houston, even John Lennon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> Good question. Really popular. <laughs> uh, they've got to have some. A special place for people that that ruin their their false images of their icons. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, Michael Jackson is is incredibly beloved. Um, I don't know. It, it really amazes me that somebody who could be involved in the sexual molestation of boys could still be held in such high esteem. Um, you have to understand also that Michael Jackson is, uh, and I, I can categorically say this, the, the, the man was, as we've been talking about, mind control program slave, um, a, a program to multiple. They made him to be famous. Um, yeah, and in, and so uh, his role for the people that had programmed him was to further continue the traumatization and abuse of other people that they wanted to program. So he was involved in the sexual molestation of boys. It all goes together. It all makes sense if, if, if the readers, if the listeners want to become readers of the book and see how the trauma based mind controls carried out. And, um, you know, it's never, never land is a uh, um, it, it is it is wording related to the programming that's carried out on these boys and, and then eventually of course he went overseas and then then he died um uh who were some of the other people that you wanted me to step on <laughs> <laughs> well um, more specifically um let's look at people for example who have um died in the uh, 27 Club. 
Let's, what is your opinion on that? Do you think this is actually perhaps people who don't abide with the programming that they just decide, all right, you're going to go into our nice little ritual sacrificial 27 club lot and we're going to kill you because you're not doing what we want you to or perhaps is it um, something that they agreed to before they get famous? Yeah, you get famous, but at 27, that's it, time out. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of both. Um, they they use a person up and toss them their expression is, is this is their own insider expression is thrown from the freedom train i mean you have to understand everything's up everything that's that's that should be up is down in their world so they call this the freedom train being thrown from the freedom train means that they snuff your life out whenever they're done using you um so uh, a certain percentage of the people are just, uh, they decide, well, we've gotten uh, our money out of this mind-controlled slave. That's it. We're going to pass the baton to the next generation, and, and they just uh, they snuff them out. Um, and, and then sometimes if the person is, is stepping over the, the boundaries, they'll, they'll take them out too. But I've noticed a lot of times, too, if a person's stepping over the boundaries, they generally think that they can, they can bring the person back in um, through their control mechanisms. Um, so I've seen them have quite a bit of patience um, because they, they believe that, uh, that their controls will work. Um, anyway, that's, that's kind of a... Um, that's not a maybe a, a real specific answer, but that that that's an answer anyway. Absolutely. Um, you would mention something quite interesting about, you know, when art, artists reach their sort of financial uh, limit in terms of how much money they make the music companies. A good example, of course, being Whitney Houston, who we um, tragically lost earlier this year in something that was quite ritualistic in a bathtub. And it just seems there's a lot of artists who die in bathtubs. We've got Jim Morrison, you know, um, it, it seems to be quite a common thing. And there's lots of ritualistic associations, of course, with dying in water. Um, you know, do you think that this Whitney Houston was a ritual sacrifice? Yeah, it, it strikes me as being that way. Um, when you say ritual sacrifice, I mean, at a certain point, they, they decide that they shall ritually um, uh, take the life of somebody and and so they prefer to do that than just letting the person uh, expire on their own. Um, it, it's it's sort of like uh, you know if, if, if they're they're trying to get the, the, everything they can out of this person, they even do a ritual death. So. Yeah, that's very sad. Even right till the end, they're still going to milk them for their soul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And let that yeah. be a warning to anybody who's um, thinking of uh, making it big and becoming famous through the musical entertainment industry. And, you know, I do say this with the greatest love for it because I myself was once there. I studied performing arts, um, was a singer and dancer, uh, loved uh, theatre and always imagined one day, um, you know, Never so much film, but more, I, I just love the whole stage and the concept of being in front of an audience performing and uh, for a moment you've got them captivated. But with that moment of captivation comes a price um, if it's going to be something that is sustained on a, gr a grand scale that is financially rewarding. And um, I think it's so disheartening for so many young children who are very, very talented who get to this point um, where, you know, we had Kelly Clarkson coming out not so long ago saying that the decisions that she was forced to make immediately after winning American Idol was, um, was insane. Yeah, it, it, and I share your, your sadness that there's so much talent um, that uh, never really gets out to the public um, because they're the ones who determine who, who they want to make an icon. And they just don't have somebody, uh, um, you just don't uh, 
um, get to express your artistic talent to the world, but they have to make you into an icon that they can manipulate the public with. You know, so you, you know, you talked about John Lennon, and John Lennon, uh, the songs that he sang, um, you have. You, you, you have uh, British intelligence and the mind control programmers uh, working to come up with these songs that are then woven into an agenda. And um, so the, these people, their, their iconic status is being used to manipulate the public. And um, so they, they just don't, they just don't allow someone to, uh, express your talent for free they've got to use you for their agenda and it's disgusting um, and, and it's sad too because like you say so many talented people out there they're hoping that they will get a chance to express their talent and there's not a whole lot of opportunity to break big, break into the uh, break big because um, you're, you're going to have to uh, go along with with a, a bigger agenda. You know, the, up, the other side of this, of course, which of course has just struck me now, is, um, you know, in this whole entertainment, music industry, um, cult circle thing we've got going on, there isn't actually a whole lot of really good talent out there. For example, I mean, there are some really talented people, but I could never understand how someone like Jay-Z became the biggest selling rapper of all time. I mean, I'm sorry, he just doesn't, he's not talented. You know, there must, there's something going on there. And yet, some really good kid down the, down the way with a really great voice will just get totally exactly, looked over. Exactly, and I, I've seen the same thing. Um, I, I know a young woman um, who's extremely talented, and she made a CD of music that she wrote herself. It's wonderful. Um, but I know that she will never make it big. Um, because she's not part of the system. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I see the same thing. And, yeah. um, it's, just, it's just a symptom of how the world is a controlled system. And you either line up and go with it, or you're outside of it. What also strikes me as quite interesting is how they almost use the whole celebrity entertainment industry as a carrot they dangle in front of us as to this is this is potentially what could go, you know, what, what you could have. They, they put it on MTV, they put the cribs on, and they keep us in this almost this this um, naive hope that, you know, we will one day own those things and most the majority of the world will never be able to afford. And in a way, they we, they sell us materialism and greed through these people. Exactly. The, again, that gets back to everything that you watch on television is manipulating your mind in some way. Um, it, it's it's it would be it, it's difficult to break down. I have seen some people break it down where they lay out. Okay, this false thinking is being laid in here, this this uh, false value system is being laid in here, but the whole thing's uh, uh, twisting in a manipulation of your mind, and um, even when you don't think that it is, it's, it is. Um, so it's an incredible... Uh, uh, incredible thing what they have created. Now let me ask you, Fritz, is there anything sacred? I mean, or is it all just a control mind control system? One of the, one of the encouraging things for me in, get, in going in and seeing how extensive the world power is, is I actually saw God through all of this. You know, it says in Second Thessalonians, the, uh, in chapter 2, all power and signs and lying wonders have been given to Satan. You know, so he's all power. That almost sounds like God, you know. And these lying wonders and signs that he can carry out, wow. And then we, we read in Revelation 3 where it says the whole world is going to worship this, you know. And you can see with the rock styles, the stars, how easily 
they can they can build someone up to be worshipped by everybody. And you know, look at, at the status of the Beatles, for instance, or or Michael Jackson. Um, how they can create these these people that that are just worshipped. Um, so, in the middle of seeing all of this vast power, I was surprised that I I, I saw God operating. I, I saw that uh, um, in in spite of this incredible power, it, it's like. Back in, in the book of Acts, the, they, they wrote something. They said, to open the eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, what does it take to turn someone like you or me? What does it take us to turn an individual and, 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 and extract them from all of this deception and this mind control and, and programming? It takes an incredible... Um, uh, epiphany. It takes it takes the power of God. It takes the Spirit of God to do that. And I got to see that. I got to see God repeatedly operating within this system. And um, I believe that that so much of what I've accomplished, so much of my safety, so much of all of this has been um, divinely inspired. Um, it's just been incredible. Um, I can confidently, honestly say, I would not be here in front of you um, uh, being interviewed if God hadn't divinely been there, if the hand of God hadn't been on my life. And um, I'm just so grateful. There's there, The only way I could express my gratitude for all of this would be on my face, you know, worshiping him. So... So in the middle of, of seeing darkness, you you see uh, light, <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a great thing. <laughs> you know, we totally we we we're all sitting here at chuckling because we so understand what you mean by that. Um, because it really is quite um, a, a journey to go on, to have a look at this information, to conscientize it, okay, to realize the whole reality is manufactured. Actually, it's quite a dark reality. It's quite a lot of nasty little things going on that are quite shocking. Um, now, to find the light beyond that, what I found is in looking at all the darkness, I found the light. Great. So you, you have your own, own story of epiphany. I think there's so many people who do and so and you know what it's books like yours and a lot of great authors around but you know books like yours that actually help people to find the light and I do believe yes there's the darkness but out of the darkness will come the light we need to look at the darkness first for us to understand where to go next very very good um, and, and one of the things that uh, probably my most important mission at this point in time is to call people to hope and to call people to do noble deeds. And um, where you were asking me a few questions about my personal life, uh, one of the, the most um, amazing things, inspiring things in my life was the song by Leanne Lomack, uh, 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 I Hope You Dance. And, and a lot of listeners have probably heard this song. So, um, but you know, it, it, I hope you never fear those mountains in the distance in her lyrics. She says, never settle for the path of least resistance. Uh, living might mean taking chances, but they're worth taking. Loving might be a mistake, but it's worth making. And um, I, I continue to love. I, like all of our listeners out there, we've had our our hard knocks in life. You know, we've, we've had our moments where love has let us down. We've had our moments where uh, li uh, th we were afraid of taking a step out to maybe take this job, maybe uh, step out and do what was right. Um, and, and life called for us to take chances. And, and in the song she says, you know, I hope you dance. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Her song says it says it better than I could say it to anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, don't don't sit out light. Don't sit on the sidelines. Get out there and live life, people. And, and 
uh, do noble deeds. Everybody, I don't care who you are, even if, even if you're in the Illuminati, you can step out and do a humane, noble deed for humanity. And I'm not just talking about a little deed where he helps someone across the, the side, uh, across the street. Um, I'm talking about the type of noble deeds that, that really take the, the kind of energy and perseverance like climbing Mount Everest. Something that when you're done, you have really made an accomplishment. And we, those things are happening all around the world. There are small people that are stepping out and doing noble deeds all the time. Um, and that's one of the things I would like to write up in a book um, is, is the, those kind of uh, noble deeds. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, and it's so wonderful to, to hear you say positive and, and, and giving so many encouraging words. Um, and looking forward to the future, obviously, um, I wanted to ask you, what would then be the next step? You mentioned, you know, the Illuminati potentially, you know, coming out and, and, and speaking out. Um, is it, would it be necessary or do you think that we could have some kind of um, truth and reconciliation um, commission where the dark entities come forward and disclose everything? And do you think that's going to make all the difference? <laughs> Darkness does not like light. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. Uh, we can always we can always be optimistic. Um, I keep saying to everybody when the whole system when when, when the dark system falls, you know, uh, you'll find me in the Vatican archives because I just want to learn everything. I want to hear everything. That's why I'm so keen for them to have some kind of uh, commission where they come out and disclose everything. I want to learn everything that they've been hiding from us and that's what keeps me on this journey doing the research and um, and learning from people like yourself is this um, innate curiosity of what is being withheld from us. Well along that lines one of the encouraging things that I experienced last December I went down to Ashland Oregon which happens to be they have a wonderful Shakespearean theater down there they're famous for their Shakespearean theater in Ashland Oregon um, even people from Europe come there uh, to participate in that. But uh, there was a, a lot of youngsters down there that are um, aware of the NWO and aware of the world system and are actively working on creating things that will give the common person incredible abilities like free energy machines these are things that they're not just um, conceiving but they're actually building and um, wow so so uh, you know I can't even begin to uh, talk about all the things that I saw but long story short it's encouraging that a lot of people out there are not just they're not cursing the darkness, but they're putting themselves uh, to task to create positive things that are going to help humanity. And although the, the system suppresses us learning about these things, they're happening out there. So be encouraged. I hope the listeners are encouraged that there are a lot of positive things happening around the world that you're not hearing about because the system is... is uh, focusing on uh, this Armageddon scenario that they're presenting us, um, you know, but uh, humanity has, has God working with us, and, um, and God is still in control, and uh, a lot of wonderful things continue to happen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Chris, um it's been wonderful having you with us. And um, before I uh, finish off, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? What are you currently working on at the moment? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, I am working on a book project. Um, and, and normally I don't uh, uh, show my hand ahead of time. Um, but at this point, um, I've already started uh, telling people about it. So I guess I will... I will give the uh, listeners a peek. Like I say, in the past, I was 
I was real reticent about any project I was working on. The project I'm working on right now is, it's called The Understanding Book, and it's a book for the common person about the uh, Illuminati. Uh, my, my books in the past have been real difficult to read and scholarly, real big um, tomes. And this book is being geared for the common person. And, and so far, everybody that's, that's gotten a preview has been really ecstatic and excited about it. So that's what we have um, ahead of us. Fantastic. And um, do you have any last message for humanity? Uh, you know, the, the battle we're, we're struggling with, as the scriptures say, with rulers of darkness. And people need to be aware that we're in a war. You know, people want to be on the sidelines and in denial that there's a war between good and bad, light and darkness. But there is. And, uh, um, and then some people want to deceive themselves that darkness is going to win over light. Well, it's just not going to be that way, you know. And I would encourage people to stop their rat race for a minute and start examining their own lives and ask themselves questions about their life. And um, what are you doing and what can you do to have a more abundant life, to really live life, you know? and um, encourage people to, to live an abundant life and to discover uh, God for themselves and um, just want uh, hope, hope that they get all the blessings that life can give them. That's, that is very, very uh, heartening indeed. And um, on that note, I think uh, we're going to say goodbye to you. But before we do, I just want to thank you ever so much for joining us um, this evening. I know it's morning there for you. And um, it's been an absolutely wonderful interview. And we'd love to chat to you again sometime. Thank you, Melanie. You've been very patient with allowing me to give long-winded answers. I appreciate the interview. I appreciate you. And, and God bless you and, and all the listeners.